How about new? Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and today we are having a look at a very cool piece of vintage electronics history. This is a digital clock made with Nixie tubes, which were one of the first electronic digital display technologies to hit market. Now, the heyday of the Nixie tube was the 1950s and 60s, after which it was largely superseded by more efficient and sophisticated display technologies. However, they remained in use for a lot longer in the Soviet Union, and today this technology is making something of a comeback among hobbyists due to its very cool vintage aesthetic. So without further ado, let's dive into the fascinating history of the Nixie tube and let me show you exactly how these work. Now, most histories of the Nixie tube start in 1955 with Hagee Brothers, a subsidiary of the Burroughs Corporation of Plymouth, Michigan, probably best known for their line of mechanical adding machines like this one. However, the history of the device actually goes back quite a bit further. Indeed, the first known patent for this type of display tube was filed on May 9, 1934 by one Hans P. Boswell, a German engineer working for the Lorraine County Radio Corporation of Lorraine, Ohio. Now, this is very interesting to me because one of the main reasons I wanted to cover the Nixie tube on this channel was due to a historical error I noticed in one of my favorite films of the past couple years, Oppenheimer. Now, overall, the film is very accurate, but in the scene depicting the Trinity test, the countdown to the bomb's detonation is displayed using Nixie tubes. Immediately, I thought this is an anachronism. Not only were these types of tubes not commercially produced until 10 years after the Trinity test, but the specific tubes used by the production designers for this scene are Soviet IN-12s from the 1970s. But given that the basic technology had been patented some 10 years before, it is technically possible that some units could have been custom-built and used by the Manhattan Project, but still highly unlikely. Indeed, there is no evidence at all that Boswell further developed or tried to commercialize his design. So the presence of Nixie tubes in the film is just an example of artistic license. Anyway, the next patents for numerical display tubes were filed in 1950 by the Northrop Corporation, though they also chose not to develop or commercialize their design. Instead, the first commercial tubes were introduced in 1955 by the National Union Radio Corporation under the name Indotron. The following year, the Burroughs Corporation of Plymouth, Michigan, through their Haydu Brothers subsidiary, introduced what was originally known as the HB-106, HB standing for Haydu Brothers. Now, it's often stated that this tube was originally developed by Haydu Brothers, founded in 1936 in Plainfield, New Jersey, by Hungarian emigre brothers Zoltan and George Haydu, but this is not the case. In fact, Burroughs developed it first at their Powley, Pennsylvania Research Center, but lacked the facilities to mass produce it. And so they purchased Haydu Brothers for their manufacturing capability. Indeed, prior to the acquisition, Haydu Brothers' main product was a beam switching tube called the Trocotron, used for decimal counting in early digital computers. However, these tubes were unable to visually display their counting state, so Burroughs set out to correct this. They also hired engineer Saul Kaczynski, who had previously worked for National Union on their Indotron tube, to develop the HB-106. Now, this new glow indicating tube was first unveiled at the Western Electronics Show and Conference, or WESCON, in San Francisco in August 1955, and went on sale soon afterward. Now, the following year, Burroughs changed the name of its Haydu Brothers subsidiary to the Electronic Tube Division and dropped the HB prefix from its product designations. And at the same time, the HB-106 acquired a new slicker name. See, Saul Kaczynski originally called it the Numerical Indicating Experiment Number 1, or Nix-1, but soon changed this to Nixie, not only because it sounded snappier, but because Kaczynski was convinced that successful product names always had an X or a K in them, for example, Kodak or Xerox. Now, before we continue with the fascinating history of the Nixie, let's actually have a closer look at this, and let me show you how these actually work. This clock uses the IN-12B, a very common Soviet manufactured tube with an 18mm character height. While Nixies look very much like vacuum tubes or valves, they operate on a completely different principle. See, vacuum tubes work via thermionic emission, free electrons given off by a heated filament in a vacuum. Nixie tubes, by contrast, are cold cathode displays, basically more complex miniaturized neon lamps. Inside the glass envelope, we have one metal mesh anode and 10 bent wire or stamped sheet metal cathodes shaped like the numerals 0 to 9 stacked one on top of another. The IN12B also includes a decimal point and, interestingly, uses an inverted 2 as a 5 to simplify manufacture. Something else worth pointing out is that the cathodes are not stacked in numerical order since the unlit cathodes would unacceptably obscure the lit ones. Instead, in the IN12B, they are arranged, top to bottom, 3, decimal, 8, 9, 4, 0, 
five, seven, two, six, one. Now the glass tube is filled with low pressure gas such that when a potential of around 170 volts is applied across the anode and any of the cathodes, electrons emitted from the cathode will ionize the surrounding gas and cause a glow discharge, illuminating the cathode and displaying the given numeral. This is identical to what happens in neon and other gas discharge lamps and again is distinct from thermionic emission, which requires much higher temperatures. Indeed, cold cathode displays like Nixie's rarely exceed 40 degrees Celsius. So the most common gas used in Nixie tubes is neon or rather a mixture of around 98% neon and 2% argon, what is known as a penning mixture. And this reduces the striking voltage needed to get the tube glowing. So when the tube is turned on, the atoms of argon, which in this application are known as the quenching gas, are immediately ionized. They have a lower ionization potential than the neon and are then pass on some of their energy to the neon atoms and ionize them in turn. This is known as penning ionization. And to learn more about quenching gas mixtures, please check out my previous video on Geiger counters, linked in the description. Now, once ionized, the resistance of the gas decreases, which means it takes less voltage to sustain the glow discharge than it does to initially strike it. Now, interestingly, the first commercial cold cathode display tube, National Union's Indutron, didn't have a separate anode grid. Rather, the unlit cathode served as the anode. However, as you can imagine, the circuitry needed to constantly reconfigure the cathodes was needlessly complicated, which is why the much simpler Nixie design won out in the end. Now, another major improvement that Burroughs and Haydu brothers made to the design was to significantly increase its longevity. See, the first prototype Nixie tubes lasted barely 24 hours due to a phenomenon known as sputtering or cathode poisoning. See, the accelerated neon and argon ions would chip off small amounts of metal from the cathode, which would then be deposited either onto the glass surface of the tube or onto the other cathodes, making them opaque and rendering the whole tube useless. Now, the solution that Hedy Brothers came up with for this problem was to introduce a small amount of mercury into the tube such that the ions would strike the much heavier mercury atoms, slowing them down and making them less likely to damage the cathode. And this allowed the lifespan of Nixie tubes to be extended out to 20,000 hours. Now, it's actually quite possible to significantly reduce this lifespan if you leave any one of the numerals lit for a significant amount of time, because even with the mercury in place, the sputtering will still occur, and this will slowly poison the other unlit cathodes and render them useless over time. Now, getting back to the history of the Nixie tube, on release, these proved extremely popular, being used in all manner of applications from scientific instruments to desktop calculators to stock tickers. They were also produced in all sorts of different sizes, from the tiny 8mm Burroughs B4032 to the 40mm Soviet IN-18. Though a company called Millclock currently produces a tube called the ZIN-70 that measures a whopping 150 by 68 millimeters. And despite the relative complexity, Nixie tubes are actually surprisingly affordable. Selling for around $2 a unit for batches of 10,000 or more in 1971, or around $16 today. And as a result, they were licensed and manufactured in all sorts of countries, including all across Western Europe, China, Japan, and India. However, the country most closely associated with the Nixie tube was the Soviet Union, which didn't so much license the design as outright steal it. And one imagines that this greatly irritated George and Zoltan Haidu, who originally fled Hungary to escape the fascist regime of Admiral Miklos Horthy, and were likely dismayed by the Soviet takeover of their country in 1956. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, the heyday of the Nixie tube was around the 1950s and the 1960s, but after this, they started being largely replaced by more sophisticated and cost-effective display technologies. For example, Burroughs themselves developed a Panaplex display, which worked similarly to the Nixie tube, but used the now familiar seven-segment display rather than individual characters, creating a more compact and versatile display that was also easier and cheaper to manufacture. Another technology that emerged around this time was the incandescent filament display, which worked rather like a regular light bulb. There were two main versions of this technology, seven segment displays like the Numatron tube that displayed the glowing filaments directly, and light pipe or light guide displays where the light from regular incandescent or neon bulbs was routed through curved plastic light pipes, rather like optical fibers, to produce the display. There were also vacuum fluorescent displays or VFDs, light emitting diode or LED displays, electroluminescent displays, and liquid crystal or LCD displays. 
And finally, there were alternate display technologies contemporaneous to the Nixie that disappeared at around the same time, including the Nemo, Charactron, and Typotron tubes, which were miniature cathode ray tubes like those used in television sets with metal stencils to mask the electron beam into various digits and other characters. Now, all of these display technologies are fascinating in their own right, but covering them all in detail is rather beyond the scope of this video. But if I find good examples in the future, I will definitely feature them in their own videos. Anyway, the one exception to the lifespan of the Nixie tube was the Soviet Union, which due to its unique economy and position in the world market, was not able to adopt new technologies at the same pace. And so they continued to use and mass produce Nixie tubes all the way to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. And this is why the vast majority of Nixie tubes you see on the market today for use in amateur electronics projects like this clock our former Soviet manufacturer. However, as you can imagine, this supply won't last forever, and original production Nixie tubes are becoming increasingly rare and expensive. However, in order to cater to this burgeoning hobbyist market, several new companies have emerged to start producing Nixie tubes anew again. For example, Czech manufacturer Dalibor Farne, who produces around 1,000 tubes per year. So if you want to buy or build a clock like this one yourself, the parts are out there. And that is a brief overview of the history and engineering of Nixie tubes, a very cool piece of vintage electronic tech that I'm very happy to be able to add to my own collection. I hope you found that interesting. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time in another video where we'll look at yet more electronic gadgets and other fascinating devices just like this. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.